Um, welcome everybody. Um, uh, we, just as a prelude to our program today, last week we had as a speaker uh, an author by the name of uh, Jonathan Emmanuel, who spoke, spoke about written the Bible in Balfour, and uh, his book, his recently published book, and there is a book review of it in the Jerusalem Report this week. Uh, so I gave out copies. And our subject today for Purim is Purim 1953, the sudden collapse of Comrade Yosef Stalin, Yosef Stalin, a modern-day Haman, based on the book of Esther. He collapsed on Purim itself, and he died a few, in, in a coma for a few days, and died a few days later. Um, in the few days, in the few years before, Stalin had launched a series of anti-Semitic show trials and executions. Members of the wartime Jewish anti-fascist committee, Soviet Jewish writers, etc., the communist leaders of Czechoslovakia and Hungary followed suit against imperialists and Zionists, the enemy. Such preparations coincided with the infamous doctrine in the Soviet Union. Within an increasingly anti-Semitic atmosphere, many Jews lived in fear. Some historians write, that Stalin's plan was to initiate massive deportations of Jews to save them, quote unquote, from secretly orchestrated pogroms. Now, you each had a handout, one detailing the, uh, those Jews who uh, were murdered in the Soviet Union, also with a map of the Gulag, uh, the infamous uh, camps that the Soviet regime set up. And also uh, in Hungary and Czechoslovakia, the Jewish uh, notables who were likely uh, put on trial and many murdered. The um, Jews and the world were thus saved by the death of Stalin, saved from a modern-day Haman on Purim 1953. Stalin's death was the first in a series of earthquakes to rock the USSR and its Eastern European satellites, leading to the eventual collapse of the evil empire. Ronald Reagan quoted this phrase in a speech he gave on March 8, 1983, so that's 30 years after the death of Stalin, but a week after Purim that year. So everything comes together around Purim when the Jews of Persia were under threat of extermination by an evil Haman. Um, now the program is going to include first a few video statements about that year, 1953, first by Nathan Sharansky, who was a former prisoner of Zion, and was at the, uh, was, he was recorded for this interview when he was chairman of the Jewish Agency. The next will be Rabbi Yosef Mendelevich, participant in the Leningrad hijack plot of 1970, where a group of Jews attempted to hijack an empty plane, and uh, several of them were condemned to death, and those sentences, fortunately, because of a worldwide outcry, those sentences were uh, abolished. And he was also a fo uh, he was a Soviet prisoner of Zion, both in prison camp and in the Gulag. Then there will be Andrei Libik from Hungary who was a witness to the events. And then, as a counterpoint, there will be a very interesting interview with a member, the cultural director of a kibbutz, Lahavak Khabiba, who originally was from Slovakia. Uh, at the end, we will have live testimonials 
from, and I will introduce them again at that time, from Yosef Bigun and Dan Roginsky, who both uh, witnessed and, uh, and suffered the events of, the, of, of, that, of those years before Stalin's death. And at the very end, we'll have Larry Pfeffer, a historian and video professional, uh, who was in Budapest during the show trials of 1952-53, and fled in 1953-56 with 200,000 other Hungarian asylum seekers. He will speak about the communist pro uh, show trials in Hungary and a Knesset initiative, which we will talk about. So without further ado, 15 minutes of video. Thank you. Can you say something about Purim 1953? What does it mean for the Jewish people? <laughs> well, you know, I'll tell you. I did not know in 1953, in the beginning of March, that it was Purim. I didn't know the word Purim. Uh, I, uh, and even 10 years later, I didn't know the word Purim. But what did happen that day? Stalin died. Collapsed. Collapsed. And, uh, yeah, well, collapsed. And, uh, uh, I am coming from the kindergarten, and my father explains to me, to five years old kid, that Stalin was a bacha, killed a lot of people, that we Jews were next in line, that it was, we, it was uh, that he was going to send us to Siberia, but now that he's that he's dead, we are saved. That I should remember all my life that miracle happened. That Stalin died, but I should not tell it to anybody. I should do what everybody does. And next day I go to kindergarten. I am crying together with all the children about the death of Stalin. I am singing songs how grateful we are to the son of all the people Stalin for this happy childhood. And I remember that miracle happened. I should be happy. Stalin died. That's how I started the life of loyal Soviet citizen, double thinker who uh, lives simultaneously in two worlds. One world of lies, when you are saying what you are told to say, when you are voting the way you are told to vote, when you are uh, reading the books which you are permitted to read, and you know that there is another truth which you have to keep only for your family. That's how my life of Soviet slave, slave started, and it finished many years after the day when I decided to say publicly that I am proud Jew who wants to live uh, for Israel. Do you, uh, Mr. Sharansky, do you think that on Purim we should celebrate also that the Haman of our days collapsed and disappeared? Well, no, no doubt that is uh, uh, very uh, there is uh, must be some very serious meaning of this because really Stalin, who uh, was uh, the two most awful figures of the 20th century who killed tens of millions of its own citizens, who was preparing, uh, after Holocaust, new Holocaust for Jews who survived in the for former Soviet Union, and who uh, died really in the last moment when everything was already, all this campaign was pre launched, prepared already, all the letters which had to be published, which had to start this campaign, uh, were written already, all the signatures were collected, the barracks were built, uh, in Siberia, and that was the very last moment, uh, the fate changed like in the Purim tale. Uh, as a child, in, uh, it was, I assume, 1953, or maybe the winter of 1952, that I walked in the street with my father, um, and all of a sudden, it was in Riga, we were stopped by uh, Russian Soviet, two Russian Soviet officers that uh, demanded from my father to give his documents to check who he is, who he is uh, to identify. My father was very tense. He asked, what's the reason for that? And the officer told, you look uh, very suspicious to me, which meant he looks Jewish and it was the time of the, of the plot of the doctors. And especially as a child, I was very afraid. You know, I, I was afraid that my father may be arrested. And when it passed away, I forgot. But later, uh, I remember something else. Um, I played in the yard and I come back home. And all of a sudden, I saw that all the electricity is uh, 
put, being put off. It is uh, dark in, in uh, our apartment and my mother is uh, sitting on the floor and crying, having a newspaper in her hand. So I asked Mama, what, what's happening? He, she told me, uh, Stalin passed away. How can we be able to continue without him? He is our father, you know. She would know that her brother, a very prominent communist in Latvia, was killed by Stalin in 1937. So, and still Jews loved this leader. They were blind. And I think that um, it's a normal problem of uh, the majority of people. People are always blind. People never know and not interested in all. They forget. But it is a challenge of the leaders not to forget and uh, make a conclusion. Never uh, count what people would say, what the majority would say. You have eyes, you have um, a, a wheat, and it's obvious that the um, only solution of all the Jewish problems is being in Israel in our independent country. When Stalin died, <clears throat> I worked there with scientists in that research institute with uh, people who were members of the Academy of Sciences and people who had other things to do than praise uh, Stalin and <coughs> shout communistic uh, um, um, uh, ideas. Um, and the, um, the, uh, a meeting was called immediately where the uh, party secretary of the institute, who before becoming party secretary was a cleaning lady, it is all right, there's nothing wrong with a cleaning lady, but you must remember that there were people of international reputation in that institute who worked in Paris, Berlin, or the United States before they came um, in a silly way, like myself, back to Hungary. Uh, this lady started crying with tears and uh, uh, we sat there, uh, the atmosphere was good at the institute because we knew exactly who was a spy and who was not. Uh, and uh, when he was there then everybody behaved and when he was not there we t uh, told each other jokes about uh, Stalin or Rakoshi or what we were. Uh, uh, we thought about and the, um, we looked at each other uh, and smiled. Um, there was in that uh, institute um, a, a glass technician. Uh, now maybe you wouldn't believe it but it is true. Um, not only you could not buy anything of luxury uh, there, uh, even uh, uh, only one or two kinds of shoes, for example, but laboratory uh, glasses like um, um, alambics uh, and so on had to be made, handmade. It could not be bought or ordered. It didn't exist. And it's what it was a separate laboratory within this institute where a very old, uh, he was not very old compared to me now, but he was old at that time. I was in, the, in my 20s. Um, Mr. Makult, comrade Makult, of course, then, uh, an old man who was an old social democrat and uh, trade unionist, who was a master in blowing glass like the Venetians, you know, uh, really a, 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 a fantastic old gentleman. And when this uh, party secretary started crying, uh, this old man who was fearless, um, um, not loud, but he said so that many people could hear, he should have done that maybe 20 years ago. It did not take more than half an hour and uh, the customary black car stopped at the gate and two people came up uh, to the hall and took this cl master glass blower away. Let me finish just this story. Uh, a couple of days later, his dead body was delivered to his family.
Thank you. What do you remember from the time uh, when uh, Stalin collapsed in Ampuri in 1953? So the, how did the kibbutz Hashomir uh, Atzair react to this? Uh, I must say, well, the basic, the, basically, we were all sympathizers of the Soviet Union for simple reasons. This is the site from which we expected our lives to be saved. When the Red, Red Army will conquer Czechoslovakia back, uh, as it lost it to the, to the Germans in '49, so uh, no doubt. We were great sympathizers of the Soviet Union, of the Soviet partisans, of the Soviet army, and of its leader, who was Stalin. We had no reason to doubt, except for the political machinations of Molotov-Ribbentrop a time before the war. But Stalin was a mythological figure. We didn't know about his personal uh, things. The only thing for which he was known already as openly anti-Semitic was the doctor's trial. Anyway, I can remember very clearly, but it's not from my own memory, when Stalin turned his back to Israel and the Jews. Soviet Union supported the creation of Israel. And the day when the Soviet delegate in the United Nations, Andrei Gromyko, who was the foreign minister, declared that the Soviet Union supports the creation of two states in Palestine, which means recognizing the Jewish state, it was a holiday. It was nothing less than a holiday. Because we didn't know which way the Soviet Union will openly declare its, this was 47, its links and its help to, to young Israel. Without Soviet help, I don't know if Jerusalem will remain in Jewish hands because of the Czech arms that came into the country. And so, these were among friends. And uh, I know from later knowledge when this changed, when the relationship or uh, uh, diplomatic relationships between Israel and Czechoslovakia and uh, the Soviet Union began, it happened for the first time in the existence of Soviet Union that a uh, Israeli diplomat is visiting Moscow, living in Moscow, representing Israel in Moscow, and coming on Sabbath to the synagogue. And Jews knew it or supposed it, and thousands of Jews came to the synagogue and around the synagogue in Moscow, and the day when Golda Meir arrived there for the first time. And as I know also from my friends who lived at the time in the Soviet Union, Soviet Jews, the crackdown on these open relationships occurred, uh, uh, happened when Stalin or his guys perceived that there is a big population that his heart is outside the Soviet Union. This is the way I understand this reaction of, of uh, the uh, Soviet uh, regime at this time. But still, it was within the relationships and it was within Soviet support of Israel. Here was Ambassador Yershov. Uh, here were, it was something entirely new. The state of Israel has diplomatic relations with Soviet Union. This was new and, and, and we received it enthusiastically. I would say that there was a kind of double image of Stalin. Stalin the victor over Hitler, Stalin the guy who led the Soviet army to free us 
to free Czechoslovakia, to bring our lives back. And Stalin, who persecutes Jewish doctors, it didn't work together. Somehow, it was some kind of, of I would say, a split sympathy. Anyway, <clears throat> the day of Purim came up, and the news of Stalin's death <coughs> must have, uh, have arrived to our isolated kibbutz in, in the week before Purim. What do we do as this mythical figure? died. Will we take notice? Will we say something in his honor? Will we drinking and dancing and happily singing when this uh, major, uh, major event in world politics and in sympathy toward Israel, which uh, Stalin represented for, for, for a few, quite a few years? Say, uh at, at this point, we have three witnesses to what uh, took place at that time. Very young individuals at the time. And uh, the first testimonial will be by Yosef Begun, former prisoner of Zion, who spent many years in Soviet jails and in the Siberian exile in the Gulag due to his struggle for the affirmation of Jewish identity. Yosef has published his memoirs, published his memoirs in Moscow last year, and we're now awaiting the publication of the English translation. So if you would, a few minutes of testimony from someone who lived through the events.
Sunt de rugă să spun că secolii, aici, montele fac rezervare de ziua, de exemplu, în zilei, automobil, factorii de zilei, Stalin în Moscou, de zilei, de pe grupul sabotăți, sabotăți. Văd în cadr, consisting of top engineers and of and of whom and all of whom were Jewish. The newspapers wrote about cosmopolitans who had not love for Soviet homeland and, and, and Russian people and Europe who toying, who toying before the West. Almost all of the names of such people were Jewish. There were rumors about closing down the Jewish theater. At that time, we knew nothing about the artists who were executed. Then came January 1953, when there was announcement about the martyrs of white Poles. Once again, the Jews, anti-Semitic articles appeared in the central newspapers. Правда, здесь лицо. Ты его карикатурс виз экзегерейтинг чуешь ноузис и синистер фейсис. The newspapers printed letters from workers demanding the newspapers printed letters from workers demanding that the Zionist agents should be rooted and punished. No one knew who was these Zionist agents, but the papers explain that American Jewish organizations were recreating Soviet Jews in order to harm Soviet people. Every Jew was a first suspect. Many Jewish specialists were fired from above fire and the rumors who circulated about the imminent deportation of Jews from Moscow. It was said that Jews themselves asked to be sent to distant regions to be, to be saved from the people's anger. As many others, I saw that the newspapers could not lie. I hated, I hated so those Jewish So those Zionists who were planning to harm our country, because of them, it would it would be bad for for all Jews. Only one hope remained: our great leader, Hamid Stalin, would not allow this. He saved he saved us from the fascists, and who knows? The, and, and he knows he saved us from fascists. And he knows that we love this country. We would, he would deter, determine <coughs> who were the enemies and saboteurs. Four days after Purim, the time it was March 2, when Stalin's death was announced on March 5, I was already 20, but I was terrified. I thought that now, finally, they would Forces. They would come after us, they will finish us. There was no longer anyone to protect us. <coughs> But on April 4, in months after the, the, the death, it was announced that the case against the doctors had been fabricated by members of the state security service. All of them had been arrested and quickly executed. The Soviet Haman and the Far and the Faro of the Soviet Haman and the Faro of our time, who was planned soon after the Holocaust, another major program against Jews, collapsed in March 1, 1933, in a symbolic, in a symbolic and miraculous way. That they coincided with the Jewish Jewish 
holding an ancient, entering Jewish history as fully 
professor of physics at the Duke University. Done. <coughs> I just want to, want to say one word about uh, Yusuf. Uh, he played a symbolic role in, in his uh, life. And in 1971, I uh, left my job and decided to apply for the exit visa. I had to, to get uh, an invitation from a relative in Israel. I didn't have any uh, relative, uh, as most of the Jews who were my friends visa. Uh, I had to find a way to transfer to Israel my desire to, to find a, a relative in inverted commas. And uh, I had to find somebody who, who will find this way. And this will, or those who applied a little bit earlier than me, and one of these persons was uh, Yosef, who applied uh, several months before me, and uh, he was the first uh, person that I found, found there in Moscow, and he helped me to get such an invitation from, uh, from Israel, and later I found, for any case, I found uh, another person too, and I uh, had two invitations because I co couldn't be sure that my attempts to get uh, this so-called relative would succeed, but they did succeed, these two, two attempts. Now about uh, myself and uh, Stalin's death. I, I was born in Moscow and uh, was living in Moscow in 1953. I was uh, 13 years old and uh, uh, I, uh, I want to say several words about what, what was the atmosphere there. I grew in the, in the country where all the children were obliged uh, <coughs> to the chant, uh, thanks to the, to the comrade Stalin for our healthy uh, childhood. It didn't depend if your uh, childhood was happy or not, but you had to, to thank comrade Stalin for, for, for your uh, healthy childhood. Actually, the entire population suffered from uh, difficult uh, conditions, but this uh, uh, but, but they all, all, all the population, uh, most of the population believed that uh, uh, believed in Stalin's uh, favor, <coughs> fatherly love. So Stalin was called uh, father, and he, he was called uh, beloved uh, leader, and uh, uh, everybody believed that he, he loved. Him and all the happiness, he didn't have any happiness, but all the happiness was due to Stalin only. And uh, when Stalin died, uh, Lomasse, uh, actually most of the population uh, uh, were, were horrified and they, uh, uh, they told, said, how can we live now? It is impossible to live without Stalin. And uh, they were all fascinated by, by the identity of this monster. He, he was very successful in this. And uh, millions of people experienced uh, genuine grief. And uh, they, uh, this was uh, a, <coughs> a irreparable loss for them, and they sobbed. Uh, I, I want, did not belong to this population, I, I felt joy, but this was a different story. Uh, because our family, like most, lived in difficult conditions. Uh, all the Jews and not Jews lived in difficult conditions. For example, our conditions were so. We lived in a, a 14 uh, square meter room in a communal uh, apartment. Uh, that is uh, all, all the uh, uh, things that were in the apartment was, was communal, but many things were absent. We didn't have a, a shower or a bathroom, we didn't have a 
uh, was vessel. We didn't have a telephone. Uh, the, the conditions were difficult. In addition to this, uh, we suffered as Jews. Uh, uh, two other families which lived in the same apartment were anti-Semitic and we suffered from, from their enmity. And uh, general atmosphere in the Soviet Union was uh, very oppressive, anti-Semitic, especially in the last uh, four years of Stalin's life, when, when he sta uh, started in 1949. Uh, it's possible to say open uh, campaign for uh, the Jews. It, uh, it was, uh, the Jews were not called Jews in this campaign. They, this, they were, we were called uh, Rokhness, uh, uh, what is called? Uh, cosmopolitans. Rokhness cosmo cosmopolitans. And, uh, but everybody in the population knew that, uh, that, uh, that the, these enemies are Jews. And the Jews uh, are the enemies of the of the whole population of the of the, of the people, and uh, uh, what was earlier forbidden as uh, uh, pre-revolutionary uh, anti-Semitic slogans of the pogromists now became uh, became actually common. All we heard often heard. Uh, um, I'm, I'm translating from Russian this, this uh, Russian slogan, Beat the Jews, save Russia. This, this, this was very common in, in, in the, uh, <laughs> that, that the people were saying. Uh, in the 40s, when I was a young child, school, school boy, uh, this uh, this uh, company of, uh, against the cosmopolitans uh, uh, began, and uh, it was not only propaganda. Uh, actually, it was uh, oppression. Both my parents were fired in 1949, and was, were unable to, to find a new job, and we actually starved. Uh, and uh, they, they lost the, the uh, uh, many lost the, in the grid uh, and uh, uh, then uh, that, my dad uh, sometimes, uh, actually it was impossible to talk about this too because uh, uh, several meters from us were our neighbors which, which, which put uh, but the, the, the authorities know about what they speak, so we didn't speak about this. But my father sometimes uh, used the word uh, balabos. Uh, he, we understood that uh, he uh, hinted at Stalin by this, but each time when my, my, my dad was saying balabos, uh, mother uh, was uh, very scared and uh, shut his mouth because it was very dangerous. One would pay very, very dearly for, uh, for, for this. But uh, fortunately, the 1953 uh, Puyo miracle saved our family and saved uh, uh, other Jews uh, from a terrible uh, fate. And actually, it saved uh, non Jews too. Uh, but the people uh, loved. Uh, Stalin's uh, the people who uh, all the population that, loved, uh, that uh, suffered so much from Stalin lived in uh, this beloved with uh, to such extent that they were wanted at least to see him in, in his coffin. And there was uh, a line to 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 to, reach, to uh, come to this coffin that many uh, died in this line because it was millions who, who tried to, to reach this coffin. Uh, and this was common. I have a very close friend, uh, my school friend, a Russian, he was not a Jew, who, who, who went uh, to, to see the Stalin too. He asked me to, to go with him, but I, I wasn't ready. I, I was fed up with Stalin 
Peninsula for the Republic. Uh, after Stalin, uh, Stalin's death, <coughs> the system remained uh, actually the same, but uh, the situation became, uh, became more, more easily, uh, actually, to live became uh, easier, both for Jews and especially, especially for Jews, but for non-Jews too. But uh, uh, the health of my parents was already thoroughly undermined by Stalin's love, and uh, they died very, very early. Uh, uh, I was 13 when, uh, when Stalin died. I didn't have any bar mitzvah, I didn't have uh, any Jewish education, I didn't know what is a Purim and what is a person, anything. But I, retrospectively, I can say that uh, Stalin's death was a gift for my bar mitzvah. <laughs> I can say also that uh, Haman, in uh, uh, two, two and a half thousand years ago, actually helped Jews, uh, ancient Jews, to, to return to Jewishness the, and to prevent the assimilation. And Stalin helped the Jews in the Soviet Union too. In, in the 30s, uh, before the, the general uh, uh, anti-Semitic policy became, became uh, uh, actually applied, when, when Stalin was uh, In the late 30s, uh, he, he became actually, but uh, it was more and more difficult in the 40s. And uh, after, uh, after Stalin's uh, uh, struggle against uh, cosmopolitan says he said, actually the Jews started, started returning to Jewishness. So, there was, there was a good, good consequence of this too. Mm -hmm. So, thank you very much. Thank you for him. Happy anniversary of, of uh, Arman's day. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Dr. Roginsky. We will conclude with uh, uh, two or three minutes of uh, bringing it up to date, first about the show trials that went hand in hand with what happened in the Soviet Union, in Czechoslovakia and in Hungary. There were uh, show trials, also preparation for anti-Semitic uh, acts, and also something unique, the Knesset Initiative. So if I may welcome uh, Larry Pfeffer, historian and video profession, professional, he was in Budapest during the planned Hungarian show trials. And in late 56, in his early teens, he escaped to the free world together with 200,000 other asylum seekers from Hungary. So, please, Larry <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Okay, uh, I'll try to make it very brief. Uh, after Stalin died, there were a number of cracks that were increasingly uh, uh, dangerous for the Soviet Union. And some of you might have heard there was an up, uh, uprising in East Berlin in 1953, soon after Stalin's death. Then Khrushchev announced uh, what Stalin, Stalin really was. Then uh, there was an uprising in Poznan, in Poland, by laborers, mostly because of uh, living conditions. That was in June uh, 1956, and that was a Hungarian revolt in 19, October 1956. Uh, these are the precursors for the Soviet Union uh, uh, collapsing uh, in the 1980s. Now, about the show trials in uh, Czechoslovakia and Hungary, uh, in 1952, uh, toward the end of it, the uh, communist leaders of Czechoslovakia were arrested including the number two uh, person in the party, Rudolf Schlansky, who was a Jew. There were 14 arrested, 11 of them were Jews, and uh, the trials uh, were carried out summarily, 
and 11 of the uh, accused were uh, executed, including Sansky, 10 of them were Jews. Uh, in Hungary, uh, they arrested, finally, or strangely, the head of the Hungarian KGB called Peter Gabor, uh, whose real name was Benjamin Eisenberg uh, before that. Um, in the villa of uh, Hungarian town in uh, Matyas Rakosi, whose name before that was Matyas Rosenberg. Okay? Uh, now, uh, there were two uh, short trials in preparation. The scripts came from Moscow, probably. These are very creative scripts, for example. One of them was that uh, we Jews, the Jewish leadership, murdered Raul Wallenberg in 1945 in Budapest, which is a, a neat plot because that really took away the uh, Wallenberg problem. And obviously, the Russians wouldn't be responsible if the Jews murdered him. Not only the Jews, but uh, two of uh, Wallenberg's uh, loyal and very important assistants. Um, also, there was another short, so one, one short trial preparation was the Wallenberg trial. The other one was a Zionist, imperialist, Titoist uh, short trial, where other Jews were arrested, and there are two groups were arrested, including the principal of Mecheder, and to a common Orthodox family, the principal of Mecheder, Shoma Grosberg. And uh, as a child, I noticed that he disappeared. Uh, people didn't really talk to, uh, to us children about things like this. It was dangerous to speak in those times. Um, he, 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 I managed, I found him in Breivark, and uh, he told me he was arrested on Purim 1953, uh, Some of the others were arrested earlier. Uh, the names were, just for the record, uh, very quickly, Miklos Domokos, Lajos Tökler, Károlyz. These were Jew, the Jewish leaders of the Neolog community. And Károlyz Szabó and Pava Szalai, who were very important uh, assistants throughout Wallenberg. Szalai was in the, I think, some uh, connection with the Hungarian fascist police, and he saved uh, probably the Jewish ghetto with a Pashtun Wallenberg. These people were severely tortured. This was actually part of the uh, dynamics of the show trials that the actors had to be trained with gently, you know, to perform their uh, roles. And uh, for many of them, this was their, they had to make a good performance because for many of them, this was their last performance, like the Shansky. Um, in Hungary, uh, what's interesting is that in uh, the Soviet Union, the doctors, I think, were released very quickly after Stalin died. Uh, Beria took charge, and you know, Beria was also, Beria, the head of the secret police, was also arrested and assassinated. That was the dynamics in the Soviet Empire. Uh, in Hungary, uh, the principal of Aichide was, uh, and the others were released around Rosh Hashanah six years later, six months later. One of the reasons was, I noticed when Shlomo came back to the synagogue that on his uh, face we could see very nicely uh, what wonderful he had, what wonderful time he had in the Hungarian KGB sanatoriums. So they had to feed them, make them, make them look more like human beings before they release them. Now, so this is the story of what happened in Hungary and Slovakia. The last thing is about the Knesset. Okay, shall I speak to you? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, now, uh, the interesting thing about this whole thing is and these are the things that people don't talk about. So usually people think that what's interesting is what you hear about. I think sometimes what's interesting is what you don't hear about. How is it that we never did hear about Puri in 1953? How is it it's not in public consciousness? Now, uh, Yosef Begun, Dan, and Yosef Mendelevich and I drafted a, a draft law for the Knesset, hoping that the Knesset is going to put into uh, on the, on the books of the laws of Israel uh, a Puri 1953 law. Uh, Two people who I sent it to, Michael Horan and uh, Zev Elkin, Zev Elkin didn't respond even, uh, Zev should have known better, he's from the Soviet Union. The one who did respond was uh, uh, Sharon Haskell, a very, very charming young uh, woman in Bikud. And actually she did the right to Babette, uh, uh, at least that there should be, she didn't deal with the law, but she, did, she encouraged him that there should be some coverage of Puri 1953 in the school curriculum. Uh, I saw the letter to Bennett, I don't know what really came of it. And I heard that there was also a meeting of the, in the Knesset of the Badata Hinuch, the Education Committee. I don't really know what came out of it. I think uh, that uh, we're going to resubmit this again, and hopefully there's something will come of it. Thank you for uh, listening. Sorry about the video. I just... Uh, thank you very much.
Uh, just quickly to give you a taste of what this resolution proposes. Proposed by law, the Knesset institutionalized a suitable annual gathering and remembrance for Purim 1953. The chief rabbinate is to instruct synagogues, Jewish religious schools, and other religious institutions to suitably remember each Purim, the miracle of 1953. The Ministry of Education is to include in the curriculum material about Purim 1953 and international communism's immense crimes against humanity. Purim 1953 is to be remembered via periodic government-sponsored exhibitions. Israel is to suggest to Jewish communities in the diaspora and also to other countries to have similar remembrances internationally. So hopefully this will uh, uh, be passed by the Knesset and come into effect. So I want to thank everyone for coming. If there's one, it's a tradition of our club. Maybe yes. uh, huh? to to plant to get something now present. Oh. <laughs> to plant a tree in the name of Larry also people who speak to the club. Thank you very much. In the Paul Harris Peace Forest. Okay, all well, you guys together. Oh, everyone together. And Paul Harris, was the founder of Rotary International. So, we're, we're delighted to uh, present you with these certificates and thank you for sharing with us uh, your very inspiring stories and, uh, and a happy tour. Thank you very much.